a quick roll call so we all have an idea of who is on the call right now. Um, so I think that, uh, Shapiro, I think you have the list in front of you. If you would just go down the names, and if, when you hear your name, please just say that you are here. So uh, we have Deshane Ed of the National Council of Urban Indian Health. We have uh, Dana Kingfisher. Dana, all right, can you unmute your phone, please? I sent her the access code, so we'll go on. Uh, I have Ernestine Belcourt on, phone, on the phone. Yes, here, Deshane. Hi, Ernestine. Hi, Tony. Um, I have uh, Jennifer Reeves. Jennifer, Hello, are you Jennifer. online? And then we have uh, Ida Stelis. Who is that? Uh, Ida Stelis. Um, I sent her the audio pin. She has yet to sign in. Okay. And then we have Ricardo Torres, who I just sent the access to you to. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I think I will just go ahead and begin. And uh, if you're just unmuting your phone or just getting dialed in, um, you haven't missed anything important yet. Uh, hello, who is that? Did someone just speak? Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> this is really a challenge trying to do. <laughs> um, a couple of folks. Uh, Dana, you're, uh, you can hear me, Dana? Because we cannot hear your voice, Dana. Um, so that may be because you're, you've got your phone muted. Uh, Ernestine, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, I'm um, moving around uh, my uh, chair. <laughs> <laughs> Ernestine, are you are you by yourself, Ernestine? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is this the same okay. thing that went over in Billings? Is it the same no. session? No. No. Oh, okay. All right. I just wondered. Right. This what this is is a one hour webinar, and the focus on this is going to be on leadership, and it's really going to be on leadership uh, in the partnership between the chief executive and the board chairs. Um, oh. And so that and so that's the focus here. And um, let me just go quickly back up and introduce myself to folks who don't know me. Um, I'm Tony Scucci. I, I live in Portland, Maine, and um, I've been working with Nakui for quite a few years now, putting together various trainings for boards for the urban programs, um, and then some other work with the National Indian Health Board and, and some other groups as well. Um, Last year, when, in partnership with Nakui, we, we put together a series of three webinars on board, uh, different kinds of board training topics. And this year, we put together a series of six additional webinars uh, on various board training <laughs> governance topics. And so this webinar today is the last in that series. Um, and the focus here really is on, as I said, that kind of dyad, the leadership uh, and leadership qualities um, in ways in which the chief executive and the board leader can work uh, more effectively together. Oh, somebody's oh. phone is ringing? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody know who that is? Okay. Okay, we're going to, uh, if it's okay, we'll just keep pushing through here and, and, and the technical <coughs> problems I think will resolve themselves. Um, so this, the, the, the webinar really was designed to have uh, the, each executive and his or her board uh, leader present or connected up on phone in this call. Um, and that apparently is, is not the case for all of you or many of you. Um, and that's fine. We'll just figure a way to work around that. Um, it really is a challenging kind of uh, format for trying to do this kind of leadership training because it, it always works much better when you can be sitting together in a room. Um, so anyhow, we'll do the best we can. And what we're really going to do is look at ways to maximize the benefits you can get out of the partnership that you have with your board leader or with your chief executive. Um, and we're going to focus on, on two, two areas, really. One is going to be on leadership skills. And, and the other is going to be on personal qualities. Um, 
I also want to take this opportunity to remind you all that I'm available in any way as a resource after this webinar. Please feel free to send me an email anytime. If you have any questions or comments or if you'd like any information, I have access to all kinds of resources around uh, board development and, and governing issues. I also want to thank Deshane uh, for bringing Nakui, working with him and Nakui on setting all these up, and also thank you, Shapiro, for being the tech support person today. I really appreciate that. All these webinars are or will be posted on the Nakui website, and they'll be available to you into the future. So that's another thing I wanted to make sure everyone on the call knows about. Um, looks like we have about nine people on, and I don't hear or see anyone else joining in, so I think we'll just proceed uh, and move forward with this. Um, there we go. So what we're going to accomplish today, what we hope to accomplish, is really to develop more effective leadership teams in the participating dyad. And when you see the word dyad, that simply means the executive and the board share from each, uh, from each program. So we're really looking at that partnership. And really also to generate ideas about how we can be more effective as leaders in those partnerships in particular. Uh, so I really want to invite uh, as much conversation as possible. Please feel free to share your thoughts and your stories as we proceed. I came across a quote that I thought was kind of, um, I, I always think of when I think about leadership. Um, and I'd like to share this quote with people because uh, leadership is one of those terms that it's a big fuzzy term. I mean, it can mean a million different things. Um, this is a quote from Peter Drucker. And, and, and he, he talks about management and leadership and how to distinguish them. Management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. And I think that's a very telling kind of quote. And I'll share with you an example from, from my, uh, my thinking about, um, about that quote. When we think about how a organization, how a board and staff uh, work with a budget, making sure that you balance your budget, making sure that the budget is balanced, is doing things right. You, to distinguish that from leadership you would, be, uh, would be different. The leadership would be making sure that we're allocating the financial resources in a way that, that align with our values. So doing the right things and balancing the budget. Leadership is about making sure we're spending money where we, where we ought to be spending money and that we're spending our money and bringing in our money in ways that are consistent with our values. So that's a different way of thinking about things. And people often differentiate folks who are really capable at managing but not too effective as leaders and people who are really good at leading but aren't too effective as managers. And those are kind of oversimplifications, I think. Um, but there's some truth to that. Some people are naturally oriented towards managing and some are more naturally uh, oriented towards leading. What we want to do is really accomplish three major things today. Maximize the potential benefits of that partnership that each of you are in in some way. Uh, gain a greater understanding of each participant's own leadership qualities and style. So this is an opportunity for each of us on the phone to reflect on our own particular leadership qualities and styles. And then um, as a framework, we're going to talk some about these five core leadership competencies, and we'll get to them in a few minutes. It's simply one way to think about the skills required uh, in developing leaders. So that's what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, and we go to the framework and the agenda for today. It's going to be an dis open discussion about leadership, how, how everyone on this webinar thinks about and perceives leadership and defines leadership. Uh, we'll look at that partnership again and spend most of our time on that. We'll focus on some of these core competencies. And again, let me say these, these are five areas that if you can look at and you can say these are the core competencies around leadership, the ability to take risks. Um, the ability to make uh, good decisions, uh, delegating, a critical kind of uh, competency area for, for leaders, inspiring and visioning. Um, we'll touch some on these, but we won't really have time to go in depth into any, any one of them in particular, but I think you'll see that they'll be integrated throughout the webinar. Uh, we'll look at qualities of leadership, and then a notion about stretching your organization, which comes from uh, someone who really has some ideas about how, the, how you can really stretch your organization, move it from a level that it's at to another level, to a higher level, and then an evaluation of the session. When we conclude the webinar, uh, if Shapiro, we forgot to talk about this beforehand, but if he can post the link to the evaluation, uh, there's a very simple uh, survey monkey, if you, if you all could just get to that 
and uh, and provide us with your uh, feedback. It would be really helpful and appreciated. So that's the direction we're going today. I'll give you an idea of how we've laid out the day. So first thing I want to do is talk some about skills and personal qualities. Um, and I guess I would ask you all just think about this for a minute and perhaps um, think about someone you know who you see as a really effective leader. And if you think about that person, get, I'd like everyone to kind of get that person in your mind right now. Someone that you see as a really effective leader. And then talk a little bit with each other here about what you see are the skills or the personal qualities that that person has. What, what, are the, what is it about that person that makes them a leader? What are those kind of skills or qualities? What are the things that you see in the person you have in mind? So this is Deshane. I guess just to get the conversation started, I think that for me, one of the main qualities about um, you know the leader that I'm thinking of is that there's an ability to see the bigger picture and not just focus on the little things. Um, the little things obviously are important, but the, to be able to not only to see the bigger picture, but to express a vision of what that bigger picture looks like helps move people in that direction. That's a, a excellent thought, and thank you for sharing that. And thanks for going first to Shane and priming the pump. <laughs> uh, you're absolutely right. You know, when you think about this ability to share the big picture, not everyone has that ability. I want to go back here to these core competencies. When you think about the idea of sharing the big picture, being able to see it and sharing it, really has to do with the vision, being able to see this big thing, to see where your organization or where your community will be in the future and what that will look like. That's the idea of being able to see the big picture. And in addition to that, you need this particular set of competencies around inspiring, inspiring people to the vision, and bringing people along. Um, so those are really key skills, somebody who can see this big picture and inspire people to move towards it. What are some others? Someone that could work independently or just take, a, take the lead, you know, and not have to be told to maybe read your mind, <laughs> so to speak. Absolutely. Somebody that can, somebody that can kind of, uh, is an independent thinker and can act on their own uh, in, a, in a way at least to get things started. Um, one, of the, one of the things leaders have to be careful about is that you, you have to always be a little bit ahead of everybody. Yes. That, that's kind of what leading is about. But if you get too far ahead, you end up just being somebody out for a walk all by yourself. <laughs> you know. Right. Um, so, so it's the idea of kind of leading your leading your forces, leading your troops, but not getting too far ahead that you're out there by yourself. So sure, that's another great quality. Are there others? Yeah, I think taking risks. Uh, this is Ricardo from Sacramento, and I think taking risk is uh, is certainly when. Uh, I think working in Indian country, there are places in, in our bureaucracies we don't go to mm -hmm. in terms of uh, crossing lines because the administration or a program wants to do certain things and we don't like doing them. And uh, I think a good leader shows us how to take those healthy, healthy risks to get to where we need to go in a way that's safe and, and brings the whole group forward with you. Right. Can you think, Ricardo, if you would, or, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but a, kind of a specific example of, of, of you, perhaps, when you've taken a, a risk? Uh, well, uh, it's probably easier for me to uh, TV example of my CEO. Uh, okay. And, and, and I think that uh, uh, our, our CEOs, we established uh, the – the uh, the center, the clinic, I mean, I think that uh, opening up uh, dialogue about how we're going to plan the center to the public, as the Indian public, and making it a very transparent uh, process, I think is risky in Indian country because you get, you know, the influence of you know, tribal leaders and tribal councils and tribal elders who may not necessarily want to go there uh, because mm -hmm. they are you know, they're set in ways of how things should be done. 
and uh, I think that our CEO is able was able to take risk in opening up uh, public dialogue to include all these groups uh, and doing some of the things you're talking about, envisioning, uh, inspiring, to let them know how this is going to be okay. We're going in this direction, and uh, uh, you know, I, I I know that there's some there's some. Uh, this is an urban clinic, uh, but. Also, you know, if you look at some of the tribal clinics, they have problems with this because maybe the council doesn't want to do something, and you know you have to do it anyway, and there's there's always a battle between what you have to do. And just it's take having a leader who is able to translate that into a healthy risk and being uh, brave enough to move people from from what they understand to what can be and making that a safe place to go. Yeah, and that's, you know, and you just raised some really good points. I mean, it's not just about you taking a risk and, and kind of crossing a bridge. You have to bring others along, uh, and leaders, uh, you know, have the ability to do that. Um, this whole notion of taking risks, I think, is really central. Uh, in order to be an effective leader, you have to be able to take reasonable risks, and that means, you know, you you have to uh, you have to develop skills around taking risks. And one of the things that happens when you start exploring your own life and looking back and, and looking at other times in your life when you've taken risks, small and large, you start to see a pattern because taking risks is a transferable skill. So, for example, when I was young, you know, the, one of the risks I took was to learn how to ride a bicycle. Um, and it was a real risk. There was a lot riding on that. When I was a kid, where I grew up, um, to ride a bicycle meant you were mobile, you get around. But there was all this kind of peer pressure and uh, the, the fear of embarrassment if you got on the bike and fell down and all these little kind of things that when you look at it in one little section of your life seem small, but when you start connecting all the dots, you realize that the very skills I use uh, to, uh, to and develop around taking risks around trying something new like riding a bicycle are the same kind of competencies I use now around risks around trying new technologies, for example, like webinars. Um, so I think all this stuff is really transferable. And the, to the extent that each of us can figure out what abilities we have around risk, what are our experiences, what can we learn from them, um, and then you find some really amazing patterns in that. And that really leads to something I think that's critical here. When I, when I ask this question about skills and personal qualities, um, I think there are really two things that are absolutely uh, essential. And, and, you can, and I'll ask you all to see if you agree with me on this. Um, people that are competent leaders have a very high awareness of who they are. They have a knowledge and an understanding of themselves. And they have the ability to manage themselves. And, and as, a, as the note above, even uh, to remain calm and focused under stress, the ability to manage yourself in different situations. So the example that Ricardo shared here, here, a C, here is a CEO who has an idea, a vision. It's informed by his values. Uh, he knows that some people are with him on this. Some people may not be. Some of those people who are not may simply be afraid or not sure that, um, he needs to take his awareness of his ability to move things forward and really make that happen. Um, and so I think these are really two keys, being aware of your knowledge, who you are, and, and understanding who you are, and then your ability to manage yourself in difficult situations. Um, I think these two are essential, and I would ask you all to, if you agree or not, do you know anyone that you would, any of those people you were thinking of who were capable leaders who didn't have these as the essential qualities? Everyone agrees. Terrific. Absolutely. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, you sure. know, this, I think it really is a fascinating thing when you think about it. Um, and, and we'll come back to some examples of, of, of this in a moment, which I think are really striking. And one of them is really current in the news now. Um, but this is, this is what I see as the kind of personal qualities that are absolutely essential, being aware of who you are, knowing who you are, and, um, and being able to manage yourself. You learn, how, you learn about yourself simply by taking the time to reflect and by surrounding yourself with people who trust you, you trust and who can give you honest information and help you see certain qualities within yourself. 
and, you, and the ability to manage yourself is a skill. That means you have to practice it, and the more you practice it, the better you get at it. Um, and developing a confidence in that, I think, that a proficiency in doing that, I think, is ultimately where we're going with that. That you're exactly right. And the way you, yeah. I mean, you think about anyone you know who's proficient in anything, it's, they didn't just start at proficiency. They started at not knowing what they were doing and had Absolutely. to work their way up. Yeah. And that's, you know, that explains why often you'll see um, somebody will come on to a board of directors and they've never been on a board before and they come on. Um, and, and they may emerge as a leader of that organization, but they probably won't emerge within the first two weeks. <laughs> you know, it might be after serving for a year or two, um, getting a, getting a better sense of who they are, and then developing the oper and having opportunities to practice leading in that setting. Um, let's ask a kind of similar question about the board chair chief executive partnership. Um, what what do you have to have in it? What are the basic ingredients of an effective board chair chief executive partnership? What do you have to have in order for that to be an effective partnership? What do, what do you need? Clear vision. You trust. Clear vision. Say it again, please. Clear vision. Uh, trust. Trust. Those are the two I'll offer. Yeah. Yeah. This Other thoughts? Amazing. Others? Uh, there needs to be, um, in, in line with the trust, there needs to be open and honest communication, which obviously there can't be without the trust, but um, there needs to be two-way communication that's open and honest. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that, uh, Tony. Yeah. Without that, you, you know, really, um, you know, you you can't work with them. Or, I mean, you, it, I shouldn't say you can't. It, it would, it's really difficult to work with the board chair right. if you're they're not open and honest with you and, you know, understanding of what you're having to deal with on a day-to-day -day -day basis in our organization. You're absolutely right. Every time I think of the word partnership or relationship, trust is really key. You've got to have it, and it's got to be mutual. It's got to be both ways. And one of the ways you, you see that, what trust looks like, is that people are communicating, uh, as the shame was saying, communicating in a way that's open and honest. And open and honest means honest. I mean, you know, it's um, you know, it's the way it's the kind of relationship you may have with, with your best friend, somebody who's who is going to tell you when you're acting like a jerk, not just be a yes person all the time. Somebody who can be that honest with you. Um, well, and I think what, what you said, Ernestine, is important to underscore that when you think about the role of the CEO and the fact that you know you have a board of directors and you have a CEO and you have to bring these two forces together, that um, when your boards are looking at who's going to be the next board chair and the next board chair and you go on and on that way, that um, it's really a good idea for boards to involve the CEO in the conversations about that. And it's not to say that the CEO should be able to choose who the board chair is, but it's simply to say uh, for the partnership to work, the CEO has to have some input into which people he or she is going to be able to work with. Um, to try and have some kind of complementarity and compatibility. Otherwise, um, otherwise it won't work because you won't have these basic ingredients. And I have I, uh, a, a chip. Tony, that uh, reassurance, yeah. too, of support, you know, on your, your uh, oh, day-to-day -day, um, um, decisions we have to make. Sometimes you're, we're faced with difficult situations or a lot of challenges, you know, and drama and things like that, and if you don't have your board support, then it, that could really hamper a lot of things you're trying to do, especially with yeah. like corrective actions or disciplinary actions and things like that. If they, they're not yeah. there to support you, it, you're, you don't have nowhere to go. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I always say to boards and to board leaders that it's, you can't be neutral about your CEO. You have to be biased. You have to come from a... Uh, you have to have a presumption that the CEO is doing his or her job well. Um, you, you, that's the only way they can do the job because as a CEO, you're the one that's taking a lot of big risks. You're the one that's out there. You've got your, you've, you've, you've got your neck out there. Uh, you can't do that work unless you feel confident that your board stands behind you. Um, so that's, you know, that's really a, a key point. 
And I think you also have to consider yourself a partner. I I I, I think a lot of times uh, in some of the boards that I participate, you, it's always the aboveness of the uh, board chair over the CEO uh, attitude, or vice versa. And you work for me, kind of a thing. And I think that that seeing yourself more as a partner and a in a, in a collaboration. And accepting that as your role as chair uh, is is a, a healthier way of approaching this the, this relationship because if you don't, then you either talk down to the other person or you feel you're being talked down to. So I think there's got to be some kind of uh, equality and partnership here. So I, I think that's important for the trust as well as for your effective communication. Nobody likes being talked down to or or be told that, you know, well, I'm the boss and you're going to do this, et cetera. So I think there's a, a partnership involved here. Oh, uh, sure. You're absolutely right. And, you know, you could say uh, technically, you know, the board, the board, the board chair can tell the executive what he or she should do. Right. And technically that may be accurate, but that's not the way anything gets done. And that you don't have to frame this partnership as hierarchical, just as you're saying. You can frame it as ter in terms of an equal partnership that each person has something unique and valuable to bring to it. And when we put the two parts together, we get more than just one whole. We get a lot more. And, hey, Tony, I'd just like to add that uh, the availability of the chairperson is very important, too. You know, if they're not going to be available, why take on the role? Exactly. Uh, you know, w one of the things that I encourage executives to do all the time and to be – and another reason uh, – or seem to be for executives to be part of the process for figuring out who's going to be the board leader, is that you want to have somebody who not only is compatible in terms of their their styles and personalities, but also somebody who's going to be able to be there, somebody who can uh, stay in touch. Uh, it's a really good practice uh, for board chairs and executives to be in touch on a regular basis. And depending on the size of your organization and the complexity of your organization, I mean, it can be something, uh, you know, as once a week, a, a 10 minute phone call. It could be even more, or it could be less. It all depends. But some kind of regular, frequent contact. And again, if we're talking about a partnership, the way that you develop that is to spend time together, focused on, on particular goals and objectives. Um, so you're absolutely right. If somebody. If somebody is, con is considering being a chair of a board and they're not going to be available uh, to the CEO for support, for guidance, for accountability, they probably aren't going to be able to do the job. Great points. Thank you all very much. Um, this, this relationship is really key because it's, it's where all the governance and management comes together. And, and just as someone was saying earlier, the governance and management doesn't have to be seen as a hierarchy. It can be seen as a kind of equals, um, you know, of, um, two parts to a whole. It doesn't have to be one above the other. They can be right next to each other. What matters is that they connect in a way that makes sense. Um, you really need these things, as you were talking about, the idea of mutual respect and getting clear about expectations. Um, it's really important when you have, uh, when, when, if you're an executive and you have a new board chair, to sit down with that person and have a conversation about what can you expect of each other. Um, and I'll tell you that organizations where I see this happening, the partnerships really develop. So it's the idea of sitting down beforehand and simply saying, okay, how are we going to hitch horses here? Um, you know, what can I do to help you be successful as the board chair? And the board chair is saying to the executive, what can I do to be, for you to help you be successful as the executive? And what are we going to do when we have disagreements? Because we're bound to have them. How should we disagree? Um, which, how should we keep each other um, informed when it feels like somebody's stepping on somebody's toes? You can have those conversations beforehand in a kind of preemptive way, and it helps to solidify the, the, the partnership going forward. The regular and honest communication. I mean, DeShane brought that up, and I think you brought that up too in terms of availability, Ernestine. It's got to be regular. It's got to be honest. You've got to be talking to each other and paying attention to the relationship. And anyone on the call who knows me knows that I talk about attending to relationships all the time. This is about this partnership with the executive and the board chair. Every now and again, saying to each other, how are we doing here? How are we working together? What can we do to strengthen this partnership? Um, attending to the relationship is really key. 
And here I kind of made this little diagram, but this really shows where you have the, the governance side of the organization and the management side. And, and they are not hierarchical. They really come together on a, on a, on a, on a plane that's parallel. <clears throat> and it's the board leader and the chief executive where the organization really come together. And in that partnership, some things are blue and some things are red, but there's some stuff that's in this gray area. And that's the place where when you've got a good partnership and a good relationship, where you have frequent contact and mutual respect, things work out really well in that area. Um, just saying that um, we think about leadership transitions, and I kind of just alluded to this, but whenever there's a new board chair or a new executive, um, a whole new relationship uh, has to be developed. You kind of start at the beginning again. Um, and if you are uh, the executive and a new board chair is coming in, don't assume that things are going to be like they were with the previous board chair. Uh, they're probably going to be different because we're talking about different people. So sitting down and getting specific with each other about how can we work together is, is, is the best way to get that partnership off, off to a good start. Um, I like this, I always like this quote, he that would be a leader would be a, uh, must be a bridge. And when you think about this partnership, it's exactly what we're talking about and I think many comments already are, are consistent with that. Um, a bridge connects two, two different places. That's what you need to do. And uh, you know, bridges aren't hierarchical. They are, uh, they are parallel. They connect two, two places together. Um, and leaders have to be people who can build bridges. Thoughts or comments about anything we talked about so far? I'm following you. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't want to go too fast or too slow. Um, I came across this that I wanted to share with you all because this, I think, you, these are 10 commitments for better partnerships, and they really are, the, these are, I think, what serves a really good framework for every partnership, including one each of you may have with your respective board leader or executive director. When you're a board leader and an, or an executive director, the first commitment you've got to make to each other is that you both have to work to keep everybody focused on the mission critically important to get focused on the mission. Um, the example that Ricardo was sharing earlier about his center and some of the changes in, that are going on, I will bet that what's probably not changing is the mission. And so when you introduce new ideas and people get a little anxious or there's disagreements, bringing everyone back to the mission is really critical. So a commitment you make to each other is, is a commitment that you'll work together to get everyone focused on the mission. Um, clearly and define each, uh, each other's roles, um, you know, and respect those roles. The board chair is not the executive. That's not his or her job and vice versa. So just making a commitment that we will clearly define and respect the boundaries that we have between us and the roles that we each share because they are two very different and distinct roles. Uh, avoiding territorial behavior. You know, you really have to put the best interests of your organization above everything, and you have to do that in your partnership. So committing to each other to do that um, and to not fight over who's going to do what, but to simply work out who can do what best. Um, adding innovative value. Uh, strong relationship is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, you know, so all we've been talking about around having a really strong working relationship is not an end. It is simply a means to an end. Um, having a good relationship, um, it's, you know, I always think of it as, as uh, what I always say to parents, and anyone on the phone who's a parent knows this, um, you know, to be a good parent, you, the, you, it's essential that you love your kids. But love isn't enough. You, you, you've got to have some other stuff. To have a good relationship simply means you have a good relationship. The idea of taking this good relationship and having it be productive, having it be constructive, having it lead to new ends, to better ends for your organization, that's where you want to go. Um, a commitment to each other to help make the board stronger. Um, you know, healthy, strong partnership. Uh, a CEO knows that it's in his or her best interest to have a really strong board a board that's going to not rubber stamp, a board that's going to challenge uh, him or her in, in respectful ways, a board that's, you know, that's, uh, that's going to generate new ideas and, and involve itself in real deliberations. This makes an organization and a board stronger. 
and so you know there's these kind of commitments around let's commit to make this a stronger board a sixth uh, sixth commitment develop a positive dynamic between the staff and the board um, you know the there are some organizations that I've worked with where the CEO will say to his or her staff we don't want you to have any contact with the board or the board chair and tries to maintain this black and white boundary um, so much potential is unrealized when you try to have those kind of black and white boundaries although there are risks to having lots of interactions there's, there are risks to having board and staff in communication a lot but the benefits can outweigh those risks if you can manage that gray area uh, effectively making communication a priority to simply commit to each other that we're going to communicate we're going to we're going to both promise each other that we're going to communicate in a way that's open and honest uh, maintain a united front it's really important when the board chair and the executive sit down and work out some issue that when they come out of that meeting they're presenting one message one front it, it's in the best interest of the organization to do that and similarly when a board of directors is, is, is in a meeting and there's a lot of disagreement and contention and you finally work it out and you come to a resolution and a decision you walk out of the room as one body not not as a bunch of people with different opinion you come out trusting the wisdom of the collective decision uh, number nine protect and support one another um, it's really important when you're entering into a new partnership um, and this is one of those areas too where I would encourage you if you haven't or if you the next time you have the opportunity when you enter into a new partnership with the board chair or an executive uh, to talk about what does this really look like you know how am I gonna you know what does what does support look like support is one of those fuzzy words too um, you know to get as concrete as you can about what will it look like how will we protect and support one another what, what would that actually look like in real life um, and then ten and finally keep passions and emotions in check um, when you think about the person who's the leader from, of the board and the person who's the staff leader they're probably two people who have incredible passion uh, for the organization have invested lots of energy in the organization are ambitious and somewhat but uh, but at the same time uh, and so that's stuff that can be potentially a strength or a weakness uh, trying to temper all that passion and ambition with wisdom and patience um, it's a good way to take two people who are real leaders and have them kind of mesh together rather than to always be locking horns with each other um, so those are the kind of ten commitments that I thought I, I would share with you all and I guess I would invite your thoughts or feedback on any of that anything resonate for you in any of these ten things well, I think they're they're great, incidentally. I, I really like these. Really thought-provoking for me. Uh, just reflecting on on uh, my relationship with my CEO, and uh, you know, where some of the stuff was is, is pretty clear to me. You know, I do well some things I may need to work on, but I, I, uh, I thought the, um, the on the previous page uh, uh, you had. Uh, one, something that really stuck to me in terms of uh, uh, let's see the positive or doing the positive dynamic between staff and board. I mean, I thought we do uh, meet with staff uh, uh, on occasion uh, after we have a uh, our retreat, our yearly retreat. It's the board meets with the entire staff to tell them what we we resolve where we're going any changes and that kind of stuff so that they have an opportunity to address those with us but in addition to that uh, if there's any concerns by department let's say behavioral health may have a department we we do meet with them as a staff and so uh, I think it's what was important for us to make sure they don't see us as a way around the CEO uh, so that we become dumping grounds for their their you know their complaints and that kind of stuff. I think they need to know that that that's not our role. That our role is simply to to, you know, to support them, to understand them, and 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 to move our agenda. Make sure they understand our agenda to move that forward in their department. Um, I mean, there are people who might say, "Well, can I talk to you for a little bit or something?" And they might want to dump 
on a decision that maybe the CEO made, but it's our, our role to say, well, we'll make sure that it gets to the CEO and she responds to you directly, et cetera, so that they don't see us as taking that and running with it uh, around our CEO. But right. I thought that was really you, good. Yeah. You know, the, uh, often I'm in organizations where I talk to staff people, and when they get real honest, I ask them, so what does the board do? They have no idea. You know, what do those people in that room do when they come together? And, you know, I think that, as you're describing it, that's a, it's good for the board to sit with staff from time to time around a, a retreat or an annual meeting to to, uh, to, to visit the center, perhaps, and uh, as a way to demonstrate that you have a commitment to the organization, that you're not a staff person, uh, and you're not quite a volunteer. You're one of the trustees, and you and your group of trustees are really responsible for uh, for protecting this organization and making sure that it stays true to its mission. Um, and the more you communicate to staff that kind of message, the better, because they, then they have a better understanding of who you are and what value you really do bring. Um, the the tendency where what I see where 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 executives try to separate their staff from the board, often that's because of some fear, and often it's not very rational that board people are going to want to talk to, that a staff person is going to talk to a board member and, and want to talk about the, the executive, for example. You right. have that kind of triangulation. Well, in a healthy organization, that doesn't happen. And as you described, you know, if a staff person comes up to you and says, gee, I want to talk about so-and-so, it's like, you know, well, I'll let them know we're going to talk. We, you know, we talked about this, but very clearly we all stay transparent here, and my job is not to intervene between you and your boss. You know, you you have to work those things out together, um, right? It, and that's go ahead. No, I was I was acknowledging oh. your right. Yeah, right. I, yeah. I believe what you're saying. You know, I always tell folks too. It's when you're that board person and somebody approaches you, you really have to in the moment have to act. You can't not act because to actually stand there and listen is to be part of the problem. <laughs> you have to kind of say. Okay, if I'm going to hear you out, understand that everything you tell me, I'm going to share with the executive because that's the way we do business here. And that, you know, if you're going to talk to me about some complaint you have, I want to make sure that you've gone through the right, uh, followed our policies and procedures around grievances and done all that first. If you've done all that, then feel free to share with me and know that I will share everything we talk about with the executive. You know, I mean, that kind of oversimplifies it in some ways, but there is a real value to keeping it that simple and honest. And there be, you know, there's clearly an exception to those things, you know, in some cases. But for the most part, uh, it goes back to that whole notion of being open uh, in your communication and being transparent. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Tony, just a comment. You, that session you covered in Billings, you talked about, um, you know, your staff undermining the um, executive. That, that's a, it's really kind of difficult to deal with when you do have um, a person like that doing that. And you know, if the chair engages in that, then that's really a no-no. I would say you're absolutely right. It, <laughs> yeah. it, it's what it, it's exactly what it does. Or it, it undermines your authority. Okay. And if your authority is undermined, you cannot be an effective executive. Exactly. Uh, and it goes back to I think what you brought up earlier. You know, the board has to be behind you 100 percent, unless there's some reason not to be. Right. Um, yeah. Good point. Are we going to cover uh, how uh, this all applies in terms of the evaluation process of the CEO or at some point? Uh, I mean, I think your number, one, your number one point uh, could could very well you know, be, be amplified to talk about how the interaction and accountability and all that uh, applies to during the evaluation process of the CEO. Right. We did uh, an entire se uh, webinar on that during this series, and uh, it, if it's not archived, it will be, but there's a lot of information there. Um, and really, it was one of those topics that it takes an hour to really even just start digging into it. Oh, yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. But, you know, to just kind of briefly comment, this, when um, if you're the executive director and you sit down with your new board chair, that's, that's the time to talk about your performance review as well. Um, and the performance review process, if it's, a, if it's a good one, it becomes the context for all the conversations. 
So if you have some performance goals that have been developed in your performance review, that becomes part of the framework for your regular communication with the board chair. Um, so if I were the board chair, and uh, I would be talking to you from time to time about your performance goals. How are you doing? Uh, are you having a hard time with any of those? Is there anything that I could do or I could have the board do to help you be successful in accomplishing those goals? Um, you know, some, I mean, there are all kinds of tools that will kind of facilitate this process. Um, and I would encourage you, if, you, if any, there's more in-depth stuff about performance review, to look at that, uh, at that webinar material. And also, please feel free to contact me. I can always, you know, can you yeah, my co-chair, my co-chair participated in that one. But, oh, great. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, well, yeah. if your co-chair has done that, you know, have a conversation with that person and yeah. see what you, you know, what you could learn from his or her experiences and, yeah. and, and perhaps talk about ways to apply that stuff. You I know, just the, thought it was the, a good point uh, to, to understand how, how you can, this is a springboard, uh, that your number one goal there is, uh, applies to not only uh, in your establishing a relationship, but it kind of carries to the different functions that you have with your with your CEO, both in evaluation and your daily dialogue or uh, the retreat or in establishing the goals and objectives during the year. I mean, I think the, all those things that you talk about are your number one goal. Uh, uh, can be applied our springboard for all of those uh, different scenarios. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So as I talked about briefly at the beginning, there are really these kind of four core competencies, and I think we've been touching on a lot of these already. You know, that uh, to lead means you have to go first. And, uh, you know, I believe that people have leadership qualities, almost everybody has leadership qualities, and you use them in all different settings. And even in a personal relationship, there are times when somebody has to be the leader. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all experienced these in some of our personal relationships where, you know, something doesn't feel right, there's some tension or something. Sooner or later, somebody has to say, okay, what's up? We need to talk. Um, that's, that's a leadership quality, to really take the risk and, and put it out there. Um, and we talked some about decision-making and delegating. Um, these are skills, so you, you practice these. And every time you, you make a decision and you learn from the decision, your next decision you're going to get better at doing. And it's kind of an ongoing practice. And I use the word practice a lot in my work. In fact, I call my work a practice um, because, and you all probably may think along these lines connected to healthcare, but you know, when you ask a medical doctor what do they do, they don't say I work, they say I practice. And the implication is I'm doing certain things with patients for patients and I'm paying attention and I'm, I'm always learning from my patients what's working for them and what isn't. And I'm learning from the research in the field what's the, what's the, the state of the art practice. So it's an ongoing kind of uh, paying attention to what you're doing, doing it, paying attention to what you learn from those lessons. Um, and that really I think is key to all this. So those are these competencies. I'm going to kind of skip by, the, by them for now because I don't think I have time to talk about them in any kind of uh, uh, deep way. Um, but we can some other time. Uh, and, uh, and when you do get that, um, when you fill out the survey monkey, there's a question that asks for your ideas about, sub, about future topics uh, for webinars. Please feel free to share your ideas there. This next slide here really sets up, it's kind of a setup uh, slide, and I think what this will do will reinforce the conversation we've been having, kind of put a foundation or more foundation under it. You think about qualities of leadership, they're really, you can think about these five kind of quality. They have to do with your beliefs, your belief system. They have to do with your confidence, and that term has come up already on this call by several folks. Self-awareness, um, trust, uh, and power and ambition, and how you manage power and ambition. So the next five slides touch a little bit on each one of these. Um, belief, really. Will you believe about yourself at work? And you know, and, and work. Um, beliefs are really at the core of your being, and these are really like you know who you really are. Um, and so being clear about that, really knowing what your beliefs are, matters. Um, confidence. Know who you really are and for whom you're really living your life. I mean, that sounds like a kind of grandiose statement, but this is about how you're living your life. You know, um, you live your life by what you do every single day. 
you know, you don't live it in a lifetime. You live it day by day. And if you're a leader of an organization, either on the board side or the staff side, this is who you are. And I will bet for the executives on the call and say, you know, that you don't necessarily think about what you do. Like, oh, I think I, I think it probably applies to you, Ernestine, but it's, it's like uh, you're the executive director, but it's, it's more than just a job. It's what you do for a livelihood. It's what you do for a living. Um, right. it, it's more than just the job. Um, you have to come to terms with your own aspirations and ideals. Um, and not getting stuck on internal criticism. A lot of times people um, are, are always kind of criticizing themselves. I'm not good enough. I could have done it better. Well, you know, you, you could always do things better, but you don't want to get stuck in always being critical of anything you may have done. Um, Self-awareness, as I talked about earlier, uh, fully understanding yourself, what motivates you, what your beliefs are, the more awareness you have about that, the better. Um, and the idea that we need to focus, every, every, uh, you know, all of our attention on our internal kind of things. I, I, when I was putting this uh, webinar together uh, and then going over it and doing some refining of it, it, it this is a place where uh, I think um, we can look at people who we may have thought of as outstanding leaders and come to find out that maybe we're a little disappointed in them. And so a name that comes to my mind right away that's been in the mass media for a few weeks now is General Petraeus. Um, and if you look at General Petraeus and you try to uh, try to understand and explain how could this happen, um, I think what you find is somebody who um, really um, kind of, I don't know what people say where I grew up, kind of got above his raisin. You get to a place where you become so well known, so highly regarded, you get put up on a pedestal, and if you come to believe that you ought to be up on a pedestal, you're in trouble. Um, Someone like General Petraeus, and I would generalize this to people like that in other areas as well, um, start to believe that the rules were made for somebody else, not for them. That somehow they're special. That these rules don't apply to me. Um, and I think that you see this positively and negatively depending on who you might look at. You know, if you think about celebrities and famous athletes and rock stars, politicians, You'll see some of those people who are who are in the public spotlight and highly regarded, and maybe they're wealthy and famous, uh, and they are still uh, still follow the rules that we all follow. And there are others in that category who really come to believe that the rules were meant for others, that somehow they're special, that they don't need to play by those rules. And I think that's a real danger when you get to that place. Um, and the example like Petraeus or some other you know, famous athletes and so on are really the extremes of it, but it can happen to all of us in our own smaller worlds. And I'll share with you my experience. I was an executive director for 13 years in a community agency, and um, at some point in that time, uh, it came to be that you know, I was so person the personified this organization, and people really put me up on some kind of pedestal. And it was, um, I had to really work at not believing that that, that was true. Uh, in so many ways, I'm just a regular guy, just like everybody on this call. We're just regular folks. Um, on some level, we do things that are extraordinary, but when you get down to it, uh, we are just regular folks. And when we all agree that there are certain rules, certain uh, principles, certain values that we adhere to, you don't make exceptions because somebody happens to be up on a pedestal. Am, am I communicating? You make is that making sense to folks? What I'm saying? Yes, absolutely for me. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's it's um once you get in the spotlight, something can happen to you. Uh, I was having a conversation earlier with somebody. I live in Maine, and one of the famous people in Maine is a guy named Stephen King, who writes all these horror movies and books, and he's rich and he's famous. And he lives in Bangor, Maine. And when his kids were in middle school, he coached the he coached the softball team, the little league team. He's he is one of these people who has always been just a regular guy, lives in the neighborhood, you know. Um, and then I think about him in contrast to all the celebrities in places like Hollywood and all the movies and and how they live these lives that aren't even real. Um, uh, and then somehow people put them up on pedestals and perceive them as leaders. Um, 
so you know so with the, I guess this is like kind of the cautionary no note about this that um, um, I, maybe another way to think about it is no matter no matter what a good dose of humility is always a good thing for everybody um, <laughs> And trust is the other one. The other key things we talked about. You know, I was, I always talk about trust as kind of the grease between the wheels. Um, you want the wheels to turn. It's got to be trust. And and really, it's, it's kind of that's what they're saying. It's kind of a contract between people. Um, if I'm going to tell you what's on my mind, I have to trust that you're that you're going to hear me at least and be respectful of what I'm saying. Um, and then there's power and ambition, and you know these are terms that carry kind of a negative connotation usually, but people that lead do wield power, uh, and they do have ambition. And I will bet everyone on this phone uh, has some ambition and wields some power. Um, it's a, it's about being aware of that and managing uh, managing that, and and um, you know, I mean that's that's what it is. It, it, rather than to, to Try and deny that there that you have these qual you have some power and you influence and you and you have ambition. So um, knowing that you have that and how you use those tools uh, can make for a better leader. So those are kind of those five qualities. I'm going to go to the kind of last little section in here, which is this idea about stretching your organization. And and as I said, you know, if you want to look more at these, you, the, the slides will be posted at the website, and I'd be glad to send them to you if you want. Um, but how can you stretch your organization? How can you take your organization from where it is now and move it just a little farther down the road? Um, and so one of the ways you do that is to is to be innovative, to light the candle of innovation. I mean, it's really kind of poetic, but um, it's to innovate and to, to try new things. Um, taking risks is another thing we've talked about. Uh, if you're going to stretch your organization, if you're going to move in a new direction, um, you've got to take some risks. Uh, improving a little each, a little each day, I think, is a great way to think about things. You you, you want to uh, do something major, you do it in increments. If you can improve, if you can improve one percent every day in a year, you've improved a hundred percent. I mean, it's an interesting way to think about that. Uh, incorporating risk and innovation in your value structure. Um, you know, the last point on this slide here about rewarding mistakes. Um, very often, uh, I mean, there are some companies that I'm aware of where uh, where they actually reward people for making mistakes. Um, there was a time, and I can't remember which company, might have been Microsoft. That, you know how some companies that have like an idea box, uh, they had something where once a week they picked the biggest screw up, and the person got a bonus. Uh, and the idea wasn't to have people go out and make mistakes and do dumb things. It was to encourage people to take risks and to know that if you take a risk. And it doesn't work out. If it was a reasonable risk, you're going to be rewarded. You're not going to be punished. Um, organizations that punish risk takers are organizations that don't go anywhere. Um, stretching your organization, continuing here, keeping your eyes on your values all the time, always. You have to know what they are, and you have to really try to stay as close to them as you can. Um, very hard to do, uh, and leaders do this all the time, and leaders encourage it in others. Um, when you meet as a board, uh, the core value is your mission statement. I mean, and making sure that everything you do is aligned with that mission. Um, that's a way to keep close to your values. Examine yourself. This goes back to that notion I was talking about earlier, a heightened level of self-awareness and an ability to manage yourself. Um, if you have a high awareness of yourself and can manage yourself well, you will lead, you know, we'll probably hear the expression leading by example. And that's exactly what leading by example is. Um, you, you be the person who's a calm influence in the turmoil, and people will catch it because it's contagious. Calmness is contagious. Uh, so being aware of yourself and managing yourself well, uh, and there's so many examples of this that you could go on forever, but it really is key to everything. Lower resistance to change. It's so true, people are more likely to go through change with you than for you. Um, and that's that whole notion of if, if it's going to be something that's going to change, you're the one that's got to go first. You're the one that's got to demonstrate the, the confidence. You're the one that needs to inspire people to, to go with the change, to trust that it will be better. Um, all this change is local, and it's all in little kind of pieces. 
takes time, it takes patience, it takes support. Um, that, you know, in my mind, this idea of stretching, and this comes from a person named Peter Brinkerhoff. I want to make sure I put his name. Oh, yeah. But um, it's an interesting way to think about how you can keep yourself on track in your leadership roles uh, in particular. Next to the last slide, I want to share with you quickly, and then we'll have a little more conversation and we'll be out of time here. Um, I shared this in some other trainings. Uh, it's called the five dysfunctions of teams. And this applies to the team being the board chair and the board exec and the executive director. It also applies to the board. It applies to the management team. It applies to all your staff. It can apply to just any kind of team that you imagine. Um, these are the dysfunctions. I just put them up here and you can look at them. Um, uh, the interesting uh, uh, way of thinking about things, but uh, when you see any of this, when there's an absence of trust, there's a level of dysfunction. Um, fear of conflict. If you're the board chair and, uh, and you aren't comfortable confronting the executive about something where you have a difference of opinion, then you're going to be avoiding the real issues you need to avoid. Um, all, all these things, I think, are, are really self-explanatory, so I will just leave them there with you and maybe ask you all if you'd like to spend one more minute do you have any other thoughts or comments about today's webinar? Um, any any kind of thoughts you may have? Anything you'd like to share? Uh, Tony, this is Ernestine. This is very good. Um, I could see a lot of things <laughs> um, that I could relate to in our organization, and I guess you know it, it'll more or less take me to start working on a lot of different things that that you've covered okay. today. And uh, I just wanted to thank you, and your your presentations are are very helpful. Um, if you could email me this, or if we could get this through to Shane, that would be greatly appreciated. What I would suggest, uh, thank you, for, thank you for your comments. If if, um, uh, if you could check in the Cooley website, maybe not immediately, but sometime over the next, you know, couple days, a week or so. And if you can't get it there, just send me a quick email, and I will gladly. Um, there's my email address. Just send me a quick email, and I'll send them to you. Uh, okay. Let me wrap, wrap this up simply by uh, to thank you all for your participation and also as a, a reminder to the executives on the call that going forward we're, we're going to test out a new idea. So we're going to take a risk and we're hoping it inspires people <laughs> and it's all these things we've been talking about. We're going to try to convene uh, a kind of um, an executive director uh, peer support coaching uh, group. Uh, it'll be conference, uh, by conference call on a monthly basis. And, um, and we're going to do that starting in January, and I will be getting an email to every executive in the, ur in the Urban Program Network uh, inviting you, and we're going to limit the numbers. So if you do have an interest, please respond, and all the details will be in that email, but I just want to let you know to look for it and consider it something you might find really valuable. Uh, thank you again, uh, Shapiro, for doing all the technical support, and, um, and thank you, Deshane, for, uh, for the Nakui support in doing this whole series. Uh, again, if anyone has any comments or questions, you've got my email. Please follow up anytime, and uh, and I will look forward to our paths crossing. Take care, everyone. Have a good afternoon. All right. Thank you, Tony, very much. You're very welcome. Hello, Deshane. <laughs> hey, Ricardo. All right. We'll see you. Bye bye. I'd rather a conference call here. Bye bye. All right. Everybody, there is a link under the chat page for the Survey Monkey. Please uh, fill that out for us. Thank you. <laughs>